Oh. Okay, so we are um, recording now, just to let everybody know. Um, so it's I'm ha I'm delighted to introduce today's um, guest speaker, um, Dr. Emmanuel Corpus. So Manny did his PhD at the University of Manchester before some postdoctoral training at the University of Cambridge, I believe at the Sanger Institute. Um, it was at Cambridge that he set up um, his company, um, Cambridge Precision Medicine, for which he was the founder and currently the scientific officer. And as well, Manny's a lecturer of genomics at the University of Westminster. And so he'll talk to us today. Oh, I should also point out, Manny is a published author. So um, I have his book here available uh, on Amazon <laughs> and your local bookstores called Perfect DNA. So just a free plug for you there, Manny. Um, but um, today he'll be talking to us about the missing ancestry problem. So um, over to you, Manny. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Edwin. I Well, there's... Um, you actually were in my interview <laughs> panel. I remember uh, as uh, when when um, I was interviewing for Westminster. So thank you for. Um, I hope I hope that you know uh, you said yes to to me being there. <laughs> Anyways, so um, it's been great to coincide with you throughout uh, the years, and um, I'm I'm going to introduce today some of my latest lines of research as a genomicist that is um, someone who is interested in understanding how genetic variation is affecting our uh, personal health. I've always wanted to encourage that um, the, the, the access to genetic information should be equitable, should be accessible, not just to the people who ha who can pay for these services, but also for for people who can't pay for it. And it's kind of, I, I would say, interesting that currently my company only can provide services for those who can pay for it, which is quite expensive. But um, hopefully as the technologies become cheaper, this this kind of, ability to have an independent, frankly, unique representation of your genetic data can be something that is useful for, for everyone. So I'm, I'm just giving you a, a tiny reminder of why, you know, I'm sure this is kind of, um, everyone knows in this, in, in, in the audience what, what this is, but basically knowing your human genome is an, an incredibly useful tool, especially to help us understand diseases, to help us use this information so that we can prevent diseases. And also it gives us information as to how we are going to metabolize drugs that, that we are given because uh, the enzymes that metabolize drugs are basically conditioned by the sequence in the genes that metabolize those drugs. And so variants in, in these genes are going to affect the, the dose that you should use when, when you are treated. Another introductory slide. So most of the diseases up to the Human Genome Project's release uh, that were genetic, mainly focused on monogenic diseases. So the, the typical diseases like cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease, which are rare and usually, you know, they, 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 they are not affected by, by the environment. However, most of the diseases that people die of in, in the West and in industrialized nations are diseases that are not monogenic. That is, uh, they are not influenced by one gene, but they're, they're influenced by many genes. Here, I'm just giving you two um, opposite examples from the spectrum 
of complex diseases and how much has been calculated that they are affected by, by your genes. So if you have a particular set of variants that condition you to type 1 diabetes, so you, there's hardly anything you can do in terms of your eating, for instance, your environment that will prevent you from developing type 1 diabetes. Whereas if you have uh, the sort of typical mutations that lead to skin cancer, melanoma is a type of skin, skin cancer, you know, if you don't take the sun and, you know, you don't sunbathe, then probably you're going to avoid having, having the disease. And that, that's the opposite, where you have environmental factors having a strong effect in your likelihood for developing the disease. So the new paradigm that we are working with now, whereby for the first time we can have relatively accurate um, models, predictors, to help us use and basically test in patients whether they are likely to develop the disease or not. These models are based on something called genome-wide association studies, GWAS for short. And so um, the way this tool works is that you have a set of population cases, let's say people that have type 2 diabetes and then uh, controls, so people who have been matched in terms of their, um, you know, ethnicity, for instance, and uh, you know, background and so on. So you, you, you minimize all of the potential environmental differences and, and potential genetic differences, uh, except for people displaying that particular phenotype that is type 2 diabetes and those that don't display. And if you look at the genome variants and you are lucky enough, you are going to have, like here you can see, on the left hand side that you have a red mutation that is much more frequent in cases and in controls and if the amount of difference between frequencies of that red mutation in cases and controls is sufficiently large and statistically significant then you can associate the presence of that particular variant to developing the disease type 2 diabetes and as research on this type of analysis has uh, evolved, we now even have repositories like the GWAS catalog that provides basically a centralized place where you can find all of the different genome-wide association studies that to date have been developed and you can analyze them and the, the interesting thing about the GWAS catalog is that it also provides the individual's ancestries that were used in uh, developing these diseases. And so um, there have been some research from people who then started looking at, you know, who's actually being analyzed in terms of using uh, this type of models which as i say uh, describe complex diseases and describe pretty much our understanding of how these diseases are expressed and uh, encoded for, for for different populations and um, alarm bells started uh, going off with a couple of stu uh, studies so um, in 2009 just with only 373 studies and a total of 1.7 million samples, um, it was, um, I think it was uh, Need and another author uh, published the first sort of sur survey of how much of the different types of ancestries and yeah, by the way, a, a little uh, digression, well, a, a little uh, break here. You, you're going to be very careful that I'm not going to say things like, I've already said it once, but I'm not going to say the word ethnicity again. I'm not going to say, this is the only time I'm going to say in this presentation, the word 
race, right? Because these are socially constructed, uh, even um, controversial uh, definitions, which keep um, with with a lot of baggage, which you know they they it keep change they keep changing, and we have uh, you know race for instance which is based on 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 your skin color which is you know not 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 really appropriate for 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 what's happening it's, it's very different from from genetic ancestry okay so here i'm uh, i'm just going to look at genetic ancestry which is not correlated uh, necessarily to what what we we know as race or ethnicity so looking at the ancestries in 2009, for genome-wide association studies, we found that 96% of all the individuals that had been used for, for, for uh, genome-wide association studies, which, as I say, they are the main tool, the main sort of models that we have for understanding complex diseases, that is, diseases that involve many uh, genes and diseases that are what most people die of in, in industrialized nations. They are overwhelmingly uh, developed using European ancestry individuals. And then on a subsequent uh, study that came out in 2016, now with a lot more, more studies. So from 373 st studies, we moved into 2,511 studies and 35 million samples. It was found that 85% of all those 35 million samples were of European ancestry and only 19% European ancestry. And this was basically denounced by uh, my collaborator, Alice Pope Joy, uh, who was at Stanford University, it came out in Nature. And, you know, it was, I think this was, in my opinion, when, 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 you know, we, that there was a, a, a call to to change things in the community and you i mean we all know that there are biases in data of course the the people from the countries that have spent the money developing developing their the research are the ones that are going to be more studied uh and you know so so why 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 is it so fundamental why is it so fundamental that um you know why should we care that we have this bias in the, in the data that we used to develop the models and i'm going to ask you to to keep that question i'll i'll give you the answer in in, in a couple of slides from now but but I, for now what i want you to see is that we have a, a very strong bias uh, that started from the very beginning in terms of this of the individuals ancestries that we are using for developing our models of complex diseases in genetics. And of course, I said that in 2016, you know, even the NIH and the Wellcome Trust and the main funders uh, started putting money into making sure that the, the data sets that were used for, for genome analysis would include, would become more diverse. But actually what happened uh, and this is a, a newer um, uh, publication that came at Nature Medicine for um, genome-wide association individuals that were using in, in those studies. Uh, what we found is that uh, even though by 2016 there was a, a sort of outroar, there was there was this call that you know we need to have more more diverse data sets. Actually, the difference, instead of being decreasing, has actually been in increasing. And here you can see a, a comparison between the, the proportion of individuals that are of European ancestry uh, and the actual global populations. So uh, Europeans are approximately 1 billion people. And as you can see, um, they are around 85% uh, or more of all the proportion of individuals that have been used. So the, here you can see, I believe, uh, yes, so these are East Asians, so people from China, uh, Koreas, and so on. 
Then uh, we have uh, South Asians, which actually are the most populous uh, proportion of people. Almost 2 billion people are South Asians, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. And, and you can see the little amount of uh, intensive proportion of individuals that have been used. Um, uh, even more recently, this is um, in, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm about to publish this. Uh, so you can see uh, through a tool called the GWAS Diversity Monitor, which takes data from the GWAS catalog and, and tell us what the, uh, where, where individuals come from that have been used in, in, in genome wide association studies. So, so you can see clearly Africa and South America, they're, they're mostly empty. Yeah, and I, I, we, we took this screenshot uh, like on a month ago, and you can see that according to that, 94% of all individuals for which we have data in the uh, GWAS, in the GWAS catalog, almost 95% are European, 3.56 Asian, 0.19 African, and so on. So um, this is not the sort of trend that we would want to see. And here is the answer to the question that I posed earlier. So why is it so important? Okay, so we, we know that, um, you know, they, data sets are biased, so what, you know? Well, um, as I said, first of all, the proportion of samples from underrepresented populations actually have either stagnated or, de or, or decreased. And the fact that we don't have diverse representation, this means that the reference data which we use to test patients for those that are non-Europeans is less accurate than for those that are Europeans. And the further ancestrally, in, in genetic terms, the distance between your own ethnicity and, and Europeans, those models that have been trained with European individuals are going to be less accurate. So in other words, we are um, having a tremendous bias in terms of our understanding of, of genetics. And as I say, uh, these biases are affecting our ability to accurately and uh, precisely apply this development, the, the precision medicine promise of the Human Genome Project is not being fulfilled precisely because it's only benefiting uh, or, or the, the benefits of this research is being unequally uh, available. However, um, it would be nice to hope that this kind of underrepresentation would occur only on genome-wide association studies, which, as I say, they are kind of the flagship type of analysis that are used in, in genomics. Unfortunately, that is not the case. We, and this is a study that we performed, um, and the, the publication has just been uh, come out. So Farm GKV is the main pharmacogenomics repository of data for drug gene reactions. So we, as I said earlier in my presentation, um, all drugs that you take have to be somehow metabolized and that metabolization of drugs, which for instance, in coding, you take coding and then there's one, one gene called CYP2D6 and it takes coding and then metabolizes into, metabolizes it into morphine, which is the actual uh, active principle that um, has the, the effect that you are looking for. And uh, this, this particular gene, CYP2D6, which actually encodes for about 25% of all existing prescribed drugs, uh, CYP2D6, this gene is tremendously variable. And depending on the variants that you have, 
in within this gene, you are going to have different optimal dosages. So, so different amounts of prescribed drugs should be given depending on your uh, variation. And, and also what happens is that depending on, on, on what ancestry you have, you're going to have different variants. And so since most of the models that we have currently developed um, are biased, and I'll show you data in a moment, uh, then uh, we, we're, we're, we are again in, in this same issue that some, some people are benefiting more from, from this kind of research than, than others. So how does Farm GKB, which as I say, is this, is this sort of flagship repository for gene drug reactions used for pharmacogenomics. So they, they classify individuals according to, to these biogeographical groups. So um, we have Americans, which would be the people that uh, lived in the, in the Americas before Europeans came. Then you have East Asians. Uh, then you have sa Sub-Saharan African, Near Eastern, and Oceanians, okay? And then you have admixed populations such as African-American or Latino. So we downloaded uh, all of the data that is available for the uh, FAMGKB database. And uh, this was the breakdown for, for those biogeographical groups in terms of the number of individuals for which pharmacogenomics data reactions have been uh, characterized. So again, 63% of all individuals within PharmGKB, which as I say, is the reference resource for assigning pharmacogenomic information, come from European background, about 28% is Asian, 3.66% African, uh, indigenous American, only 0.10%, all right? So um, we find the same situation. And if we actually compare the percentage of the global population, as I said earlier, the Central and South Asian, um, which are around two, 2 billion people, represent 26% of all the global population, and, and there's only around 2.15% of all the data that we have in FAMGKB that are Central and South Asian. Whereas Europeans, which are around 14% of the global population, we ha they have around 63.5% of all the individuals that have been used. And, and the least represented in absolute terms are actually indigenous Americans. So, around 50 million indigenous Americans, they have um, about 0.1% of all data that exists for which we know pharmacogenomics information. If we actually then proportionally were to represent uh, the actual amount of, of data that there is for each of the different biogeographical regions, uh, so proportionally speaking, since the Central and South Asians are around 2 billion people, when relative to, to that amount of information, actually they are the least well represented, right? So they are even less well represented, proportionally speaking, than the indigenous American. And then, um, so, so if, if they were as well in, in the same proportion as they are, present in the global population, then they all will have this one, right? One means you have the same proportion of representation versus the total global population. Something that also, also got, kind of piqued my curiosity was the fact that, you know, East Asians, they are, you know, in terms of their actual proportion, they are, they are as well represented as their global proportion in terms of existing data. However, um, something that I also am I'm, I'm, I'm doing research here, um, having measuring representation of the different global populations is incredibly tricky because if you look at the, uh, the different maps here, um, so you, you have, for instance, North Africa as 
Middle Eastern people, and you may have, uh, you know, you're comparing people from Indonesia that may be really very different from, you know, uh, people in Northern China. And Oceanians is, is, is the same. So, so actually, these classifications are entirely artificial and they don't capture the nuance, the, the continuous. So there are no categories. In, in fact, when you look at the, the different ancestries and, and their distances in terms of genetics, you don't have clear borders like what we are trying to do here. So, so this classification by definition is, uh, is, is, in, is, not, is not real, it's an artifact. But of course, because of the different uh, policies that we have in countries like the US or even the UK, where you know, they always ask you what, what ethnicity you are and, and so on, people tend to, to sort of try to group these countries uh, and then they, they, they overlap or apply those um, same definitions to, to genetics, which is, which is not really applicable. So, but as I was saying, um, the, the actual proportion of global population versus their relative representation is also, in my opinion, a very, very poor uh, measure for representation of, of the variability that exists in the world. The reason being is that we know that, that Africa is actually the most diverse uh, continents in in terms of, of genetic uh, variability and there is more variation within Africa in terms of genetic variants than the rest of the world combined so if we were actually going to represent uh, all of the diversity that exists in, in in the different continents we would need a lot more individuals in Africa because of the uh, amount of variability that exists in there and the, the reason for that is that because you know um, humans originated some somewhere in East Africa three, three homo sapiens around 300,000 years ago and you know it's only it only was like 80,000 years ago that um, the, the, the first homo sapiens came out of Africa so there has been a huge amount of time for evolution within Africa that has not happened up anywhere else in the world. And um, because of that, we have a huge amount of, as I say, variability in Africa. And coming back to, the, to this gene that I mentioned that metabolizes 25% of all prescribed drugs, CYP2D6, uh, we find that, you know, coding, which is a very common type of um, drug, uh, because in Ethiopia, around 30% of all Ethiopians have a duplication that causes adverse outcomes, they've decided to uh, straight away ban, ban uh, prescription of coding, because around 30% of, of Ethiopians are what we call ultra rapid metabolizers. So they have more copies of this particular gene, which makes them metabolize uh, coding faster and so you get kind of an overdose overdose of of uh, its active principle morphing into the blood which can lead to uh, you know cardiac uh, respiratory arrest for instance and so people can die and we also see other similar examples with tamox tamoxifen which is also um, metabolized for C by CYP2D6 and is being used for, for breast cancer. Um, I'm going to skip over this. Another um, important drug, which is warfarin. Uh, warfarin is an anticoagulant that is used for, you know, basically uh, avoid thrombosis. And it's among the top four drugs leading to hospitalization for adverse drug reactions in, in South Africa. And as it happens, because our understanding of how warfarin is metabolized is much better in Europeans, we actually can predict quite accurately uh, whether adverse drug reactions would occur by administration of warfarin in Europeans. And that actually cannot be uh, translated any, into any other um, ancestries because this model apparently only works for 
for, for Europeans. And then the other thing is that, you know, all of the understanding that we have for warfaring is based on African Americans, uh, which are actually admixed. And so they are not exactly like the, in terms of ancestry uh, variants, like, like Sub-Saharan Africans. So, so there is, we use um, African Americans as proxy, but, you know, still they, they don't represent the actual diversity uh, that we have for Sub-Saharan Africa. And then here, uh, you may have heard of the UK Bio Bank, which contains currently around 500,000 individuals for which we have the genetic data. And the, the GWAS models, weighted GWAS models that have been used to predict disease, um, the, if the sort of frame would be, you know, um, accuracy, the, the maximum accuracy uh, is in Europeans, we can call it that one. If the sort of reference accuracy that happens in European is one, uh, if we used for in, in, a, in a study that was developed by Martin et al. in Nature Genetics for 17 very important diseases like type 2 diabetes, the, the ones, the usual sub suspects, we can see that the accuracy and of the applicability uh, of the existing models for prediction of risk uh, decrease uh, with Africans being the least well uh, accurate types of uh, models for prediction of, of risk uh, in, in, in this study. So um, if, if it wasn't enough, actually, um, the, there's also sex biases. Uh, for instance, we have that women experience twice as often as men uh, adverse drug reactions um, f and uh, due to greater life expectancy in many regions of the world, women often comprise a higher proportion of the elderly population and are more likely to require what we call polypharmacy, that is usage of, of more than one uh, drug. And uh, we find, for instance, that there are no clinical trials that use pregnant women, obviously for, for, for safety reasons. But um, however, uh, when, when we look at the proportion of women that represent uh, participants in drug efficacy of, of some pharmac pharmacokinetic studies, we only find that around 38% are women, even despite they are more likely to, to, to get adverse drug reactions. Um, I have here one, one um, particular example for chronic kidney disease, where only 45% of trial participants were women, whereas women are 33% more likely to, to, than men to suffer from chronic kidney disease. And so, as I said, you know, there are, there are huge uh, biases as well in terms of, of gender. Uh, here I'm giving you, uh, in terms of clinical trials, the, the proportion of the participants by ancestry. And again, you can see that for all clinical trials, uh, this, this came from FDA, from, from the FDA report um, between 2015 and 2019. So 76% of all individuals that have been used in the FDA reports for clinical trials were of European ancestry, 11% Asian, 70%, 7 percent African, African American, and then uh, six percent others. So um, here's another uh, important point for reflection. But also, even the the, the genomics workforce uh, is well underrepresented. So <clears throat> we published again last year this this paper from the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which incorporates uh, genomic uh, institutions like the Broad Institute, Sanger Institute, and, and around a thousand institutions that are involved in, in genome research. And when we look at the um, gender balance of people who are involved in, in, in the uh, GA4GH, the Genome Alliance for Genomics and Health, around 82% are male and only 18% female. And then if we look at the steering committee, uh, people in leadership, around 20% are women, 79% are male. And 
if we then were to uh, look at those people from the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, uh, around 78% are based on what we call the, the core Anglosphere. Here you can see the core Anglosphere, which is basically US, Canada, uh, Ireland, UK, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. So around 78% of all people who are involved in, in genome research come, comes from, from this health genome research, comes from, from those countries. And so, but that's not enough. Um, you may have heard of direct-to-consumer genetic testing, like um, companies such as Ancestry.com, 23andMe. In a study that we performed in 2016, we basically downloaded uh, and curated um, publicly accessible, publicly available 23andMe genotype data. So there are repositories uh, such as one called OpenSNP, also the Personal Genomes Projects and so on, which are um, places where people can actually upload their, their genotype for, for, for sharing purposes. And so we ended, we looked, we scouted the, the, scouted the internet and then we looked in a series of resources. You can see the actual research in, in this, in this preprint. And basically we then extrapolated the ancestry of the people for which we scouted and we, we, we found uh, legitimate genotype data on the internet from direct to consumer uh, sources and basically, uh, uh, by by sheer extrapolation, we calculated that around 95% of all people who have uh, shared their genome types from 23andMe and so on, they are of European origin. But of course, um, that that doesn't preclude that you know uh, you know may, maybe there are some cultural differences that we are not taking into account. You know um, also these these uh, direct to consumer uh, companies uh, basically target europe and, and north america as their market so if you want to buy for instance 23andme in in south america you can't buy because they don't ship it there so i mean there's there's a, a huge amount of underlying social economic biases that you know lead us to to to, to these kind of numbers so what this all means then is that our ability to really be able to stratify high-risk individuals in what we call underrepresented populations is compromised. And sometimes even uh, when you do research, and I've seen it many times, and I'm guilty as everybody else for, for doing that, is that, you know, for instance, the UK Bio Bank, for which around uh, nearly 400,000 are what they call white British, and they um, they discard the other, the other population simply because you don't have enough statistical power, and you know because you really want to find uh, you know, these these differences in very complex uh, statistical frameworks. Sometimes you know you you basically discard underrepresented populations so that you can get ma a much stronger statistical signal. And so, uh, because of that, then potentially medical practices are being informed by and benefiting only a subset of individuals. And so, um, why why is this happening? Well, uh, mostly it's because, as I said, the 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 data from individuals come from the countries where they have spent the money. So it's it's basically rich and poor. Um, but of course, there are also social, political, structural, and language-related barriers. Um, also, there's a lack of awareness of this work, and you know, even even and, and most worryingly, we have no standards, first of all, on how to measure this. Because depending on, on which resource you look at, they are going to have different uh, subsets of ancestry. You, even even in the slides that I have shown you for clinical trials, I have different uh, sort of groups, you know, for some of them, as you have seen, I've shown them as sub-Saharan Africans, some for, for clinical trials, I've shown you, um, you know, Africans alone for GWAS, but and this is not because I'm trying to sort of be difficult. It's just that, you know, uh, that's the data that, that exists. So there's not even 
uh, a way for, for us to talk between the different uh, data resources that are out there. And so part of the message that I want to say here is that, you know, um, even, even uh, our, our own scientific understanding of genetic ancestry is, is not it is not homogeneous and 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 that's precisely uh impairing understanding the actual extent of the gap that we need to fill in so if if and i believe that if, if we can't measure the problem we are not going to be able to address these these differences so how how can we actually mitigate this well um we we really need to remove the systematic or the systemic barriers and biases that exist uh, so that we provide fair opportunities to access of scientific advancement for, for all. And I mean, this is this was published in, in this particular uh, paper, which I'm happy to, uh, it's, it's actually openly accessible. So have a read if you are interested in. But I think primarily um, we, even with the current uh, efforts that have been performed, and you know, I, uh, the, I think it was yesterday or a couple of days ago, we had the All of Us um, diversity genomes that from the US that were published. Uh, they had around 250,000 uh, whole genomes that were sort of published and, and, and analyzed around 50% were non-European. So this is tremendous progress. But even there, um, there these studies, uh, this particular one is only restricted to people who live in the US. And, and so we're, we're still sort of very far from being able to address the, the differences uh, outside of, of rich countries. And so just to um, wrapping up, what, what we've learned with all of this is that, you know, we know that there are biases, but really our ability to even uh, be able to quantify these biases is tremendously uh, underdeveloped. Um, and we haven't even, I haven't, I haven't even talked about people who have disabilities, like for instance, deaf, blind, uh, people with Down syndrome. These, there's nothing about uh, these studies because it's not even, doesn't even get recorded in the in the reference data sets that we use then to to, to sort of infer knowledge in the in, in precision medicine for for, for and gen genomic medicine we don't we also don't know how some diseases uh, that are uh, more uh, prevalent in some regions of the world are actually affected in terms of the proportions that we have uh, for, for individuals and sometimes uh, we don't know what whether what we know is actually applicable to some populations or is is not. Um, I have also said in in this presentation that even though we have some data for pharmacogenomics in South Asians, actually proportionally speaking, they are the least well represented. But even if we were going to talk about relative representations, um, the actual amount of individuals that would be required to to really represent all the diversity doesn't correlate very well with the with the absolute number so we will have we would need a lot more people from africa to to be able to understand all the all the differences simply because there's so much more uh, variability genetically speaking i've also mentioned that um you know africans have uh, they're particularly affected by uh, the lack of data, suffering, for instance, like four times more than Europeans, adverse drug reactions for uh, incredibly um, well-prescribed drugs such as warfarin. And just to summarize, um, we've, we've compared the proportion of genomic data available from different ancestral populations using data from genome wide association studies. Um, we've also analyzed the diversity of researchers in the genomics field. And you know, if we want to have diversity, equity, diversity, and inclusion, we also need to think about the workforce, not, not just from the point of view of um, not just from the point of view of um, gender, but also um, where they're from. 
And to conclude, uh, as genomics plays an increasingly significant role in healthcare, we, it is it's really imperative that we have these insights available to everyone uh, in, in a proportion that they can, they can benefit like any other, irrespective of their ancestry or sex, uh, in social background. We have found that quantifying global genomics data uh, is critical for understanding where we are at in terms of the promise of precision medicine, which hinges very much on, on the human genome. And if we don't take action, uh, these inequities will have tremendous consequences for underrepresented populations. And just to close my, my presentation, I want to, I want to close with, with this Article 15 uh, of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which was adopted by uh, the United Nations, I believe, in, uh, in the 60s. I don't remember exactly when, but it says that everyone, absolutely everyone, has the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications, okay? And so um, we did really need to recognize the benefits of international contacts, cooperation in the scientific field so that um, we make the promise of the Human Genome Project a reality that is for everyone. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for your attention and I'm open to, to any questions. Um, thank you. Great, awesome. Uh, thank you, Manny. That was really, really fascinating. Um, so um, does anybody have any questions? Feel free to kind of turn on your microphones or to pop your question in chat. Is it possible that, uh, Edwin, you, you tell me the questions? Yes, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll relay the questions to you. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah well, well, I think Matthew has a question. Um, while he's typing, I can kind of ask one um, myself. Um, and, um, I, I never, to be honest, I never even really thought about the that the impact of like heterogeneity and homogeneity between different kind of regions of the world um, in terms of needing, yeah, powering the number of um, sequencing amount of sequencing data we need. Can I get a sense like what's the order of magnitude um, in terms of like um, the the heterogeneity in Africa versus like the rest of the world? Like how much more coverage do we need? Uh, I, I think we, the, the short answer, Edwin, is that mm -hmm. we, we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think, um, as I said, even before we go into that, I would, I would say that um, for for us to be able to know how much coverage we need, I mean, we, we have the sort of blunt estimations just by looking at, at, at individual numbers, and of course that that's that's a start. But you know, we still we still don't agree on categories of how we classify populations and 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 how they they, they benefit. So I think there's there's a number of lines that you know where where we need to make advances for for us to then be really be able to um, estimate the, the numbers. Um, but I think, you know, for now, if we uh, look at the number of individuals and, and making sure that at least the, the proportions that are relative uh, are, are at least, you know, uh, yeah. balanced, that, that would be a start. But as I say, that's, that's, that's a very blunt uh, and, and, and raw, type of, of measurement because it doesn't, it, it, it basically um, assumes that the amount of variability within a particular geographical region is is similar to any other. And we know that th there's more variability in, in different regions. Yeah. Okay, um, so Ben has a question about um, the adverse reactions in, in Ethiopians with codeine. Um, yeah. Is this the same effect um, with other opioids? Um, um, do the synthetic ones, uh, do they have, like, are there the same problems with the synthetic opioids like tramadol, for example? I, I can only speculate, but mm -hmm. I mean, the reason for this mutation is that you have uh, extra copy of that gene, which means that you have more, more activity. And I would expect that it would, it would apply to other opioids. 
Okay, no, okay. And so Matthew also had a question. Um, he wanted to ask, um, so if a lot of, if there's all these kind of biases in, in the um, representation of the genome data, how do we kind of get out of this? Um, like, what are some strategies? Um, should we wait for the technology to get cheaper or more accessible, or do we kind of create financial incentives to try to study underrepresented ancestries? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, the million million dollar question. I mean, obviously, uh, we need to look at all the different uh, sort of angles. If, if, if you know, we, we, we have the angle of investing more money. We also have the angle of raising awareness. We also have the angle of uh, technology development. And we also have the angle of uh, regulation and, and, and access of, of this type of technologies. Um, so it's, it's a complex um, orchestration for, for this to become more equal. But I think, you know, um, something that you said uh, at the very beginning, you, know, you, you didn't know, Edwin, you said you didn't know that, that this had such a tremendous effect. Cool. So at least we are now beginning to be aware. And, and that, that's the beginning, right? So uh, awareness, let's start, let's start first with awareness. And, and then from there, we'll, we can work uh, to get into closing the gap. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, Rodrigo, do you want to turn on your mic to ask so people don't have to keep listening to you? <laughs> yes, hold on a second. Just putting the mic on. Yeah, so I, I was wondering where that mistrust from some population comes from, if there's any information. Because and I was wondering if it has to do with the uh, some ethics points or how previous studies have been carried out without people's concerns, or if it is it the lack of some laws in terms of the use and protection of people's genomic data. So something that some people might consider it should be private and then might be made either public or might be used by companies for profit or not for profit, but it might be used without people's consent. So I was wondering where that mistrust comes from. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much for that, that question, Rodrigo. Um, so there are many examples of mistrust. Uh, one, one notable one is uh, the one from Oceanians, formerly uh, known as uh, Australian Aboriginals, which mm. apparently is not the right uh, term, to, so I call them Oceanians. So uh, they, uh, the, 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 there is a notable uh, set of uh, situations with, with these populations. They, they have a very, some cultural uh, expressions whereby, you know, even taking a picture, you know, they, they understand it as, as they're sort of taking part of their being. So uh, it has to do with the basically performing, they, they have found, for instance, uh, aboriginals in, in museums that have been analyzed and then without consent of the relatives who, who were around. So I think there has been the issue of what some people call genetic colonialism, mm -hmm. where um, people who were unaware and they, they were, they, they, you know, their relatives or even themselves, they were analyzed uh, without their, their proper consent. Um, oh, so Ben has another question. Um, oh, sorry, also, yeah, actually Matthew had a question. Um, so he was saying that um, since uh, parts of the world, like in West Africa and South Asia, are becoming increasingly industrialized and urbanized. Do you think that that would help with um, improving the access to the technology to kind of increase the representation in these areas? I mean, at the end of the day, it's a question of how expensive it is to um, mm -hmm. perform this, this type of analysis. And also having the appropriate infrastructure and supply uh, change for people to be able to perform these types of analysis. So, yeah. Um, sorry, there's a bit of background 
Can you hear me? Thanks. So yeah, it's. I think it's a question of of, of poverty. Um, I would say probably this is just my speculation. Okay, so I, mm. I cannot give you an actual scientific uh, answer, but I mean we we know that you know if we, if you can afford. Uh, you know, rather than having to worry about what you're gonna eat next 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 day or something, now you can have enough cash so that you can, for instance, have better better healthcare, better access to technology. Then then you should be able to have a much better uh, access to this kind of technology. And uh, and Ben also was asking about the the role of geopolitics in this. Is it is it does that complicate kind of the, the process of getting um, information from certain regions of the world, like China, for example? Well, um, certainly. I mean, um, the factory, genomics factory of the world, BGI, Beijing Genomics Institute, they were the biggest sequencing center in the world. Um, I've used them a lot of times. Now they've become uh, blacklisted by the US government because apparently um, they think that all of the data that was sent to them, they were keeping it so that they could then use it for their own purposes. So um, stat strategically speaking, uh, this, this kind of data, you know, it has, has a tremendous uh, value and therefore um, it has a, a, a sort of perceived uh, strategic value in, in terms of geopolitics. Yeah. yeah, and I, I mean, I, I imagine it it's, gets more, even more complicated um, when you, even when you consider different healthcare systems around the world and how that information can be used by countries with private healthcare versus public, for example. Yeah, I'm going to have to go because I have another meeting now. Oh, yeah, <laughs> no, no, but yeah, uh, yeah, I think um, that was really great. Um, yeah, thanks for, for your time and thank you everybody for attending and um, that was really interesting. So if you ever want to get in touch, that that um, QR code is goes to my email. So send me a drop me a line. Happy to, awesome. to discuss. Great. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, but um, yeah. Thanks for coming again. Thank you very much, Manuel. You're very welcome. Okay. I'm gonna start recording.